Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining today's Housing Choice Voucher Dashboard Demonstration. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. If you have a question during the conference, feel free to, to direct it to us by selecting all panelists in the chat drop-down menu. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, at which time there will also be an opportunity to ask your question over the phone. And just a reminder that this call is being recorded. With that, it is my pleasure to turn the call over to Network Analyst Danielle Tinsley. Danielle, please go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our Regional Director, Kelly Lyons, could not be on the line immediately. But on her behalf, I really want to thank um, all of you for the work that you do. Um, without you, the PHAs that are on the ground and providing the services, the HUD programs would not be there to benefit the participants. So we're especially grateful for the work you've done to continue to serve the community throughout this pandemic. Um, learning new ways to do business, um, working through the challenge of technology and um, managing work while um, dealing with family and kids at home. So all of those things uh, we struggle through as well, and we just really appreciate the work that you do. Um, we talked about uh, some of the things that have been going on, and it's amazing, you know, while HUD does have some responsibilities and duties around oversight of the programs, if you've been around for a few years, hopefully um, you've recognized that PIH especially has placed a lot more emphasis on um, developing strong partnerships and finding ways to assist our industry partners in providing safe and affordable housing in the community. And so given the economic impact of the pandemic, our role and your role is more important than ever. And so HUD continues to look for ways to improve how we do business and how we support the work of our industry partners. So it's in that vein that um, we're meeting today. Um, while the two-year tool continues to be our premier tool to assist PHAs in the management of the Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, we hope the HCV dashboard is a beneficial tool for you as partners in monitoring and managing the program. Um, we recently started using it. It's a wonderful tool, um, a way to make sure that we're all on the same page on where we stand and, and what we're doing in the program. So just again, know that we're thankful and grateful for your dedication. Um, I'm sure that many of you have been hearing from your field office contacts regarding HCV leasing, and we will continue to reach out to you to provide technical assistance, training, and support, and look forward to our continued partnership. So with that said, I believe we're going to turn it over to Marika, who is going to introduce you to the dashboard. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Danielle, for that introduction. Um, my name is Marika Bertram. I'm a program analyst in the Housing Choice Voucher Program Support Division, and I'm excited to be here today to be talking with you all about our Housing Choice Voucher Data Dashboard. Um, and specifically, this is our second release. So um, for those of you who may be aware, right before the pandemic um, occurred last year, we actually did release an um, initial version of the public-facing dashboard um, for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, that initial release really focused around our national viewpoint as well as going down to the state level. But we did hear a lot of user feedback that indicated that they would be interested in seeing the data at a PHA level as well as um, with regard to moving to work agencies. And so as a result of some of this user feedback, um, we really wanted to uh, expand the dashboard and showcase it here for you today. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you can even access this dashboard. So the first thing you'll want to do is you can go to our HUD.gov webpage, and you can also Google this as well. If you look up HUD and HCV dashboard, it's going to be the first thing that pops up. So we have a HUD.gov website with this um, specific dashboard, and you can see here that we have the dashboard actually embedded within the URL. 
Um, for those of us who think that this is a little too small um, to be able to really interact with, we encourage you to use this link right here, which will actually open the dashboard up into its own separate window, which will make it much more easy to use, be able to interact with, and be able to see. Now, on this um, specific dashboard web page, I will also encourage you to look at our new enhanced uh, and improved voucher dashboard user guide, as well as data dictionary, which includes all of the information around how we calculate the various fields within the dashboard, as well as how to use this dashboard. And it has been updated for all of the enhancements in this dashboard too. It looks like Merica just dropped off the line. Hi, everyone. Let's um, give her a minute to try to get back online. Uh, there was some technical issue earlier with her telephone. All right, and I do believe she's coming back on the line now. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry about that. I had uh, my phone decided to drop back out um, out of nowhere, so I apologize. Um, what I wanted to talk about was the fact that we also, in, in addition to our data dashboard um, and our dictionary here, we also have a video tutorial. And very helpful for you if you'd like to look at this dashboard demonstration at an alternate time. While we all are um, recording this demonstration, this dashboard tutorial video gives you a good, a lot of good information around um, the dashboard itself and you can share it with your staff. Um, we also encourage you to reach out to us via the email address hdvdashboard at hud.gov and you will be able to identify any questions you have for us, and all of myself and my colleagues in the Program Support Division are looking at that email address regularly. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into the actual dashboard itself. So, so when you look at the dashboard specifically, you're first going to see a lot of information around where the data is sourced from. You're going to see that it comes from multiple HUD administrative systems, including HUD CAP budget system, our voucher management system, and our PIC system. You're also going to notice that we provide the vintage of the data right here. So right now we have January 2021 data, and that includes all of our moving to work agencies as well. Uh, when you look at this information here, you're also going to be able to identify the fact that you can move between the different report pages using these specific arrows down below. So when you go to the very first report page, um, you're going to be able to see a national vantage point. And that national vantage point is going to show all of the specific voucher information. Uh, and that is going to give you a lot of information around the voucher program in general. So you're going to have your year-to-date tax expenditures as a percentage of budget authority, your budget utilization, your overall housing choice voucher total reserves as of the end of the calendar year that's been reconciled. You're going to have year-to-date leasing percentage, average per unit cost, and our leasing potential number right here, as well as our overall trend for budget and unit utilization. Now, all of these numbers are for the nationwide Housing Choice Voucher Program. And one thing I want to touch on is the leasing potential right here. Um, one of the things that Public and Indian Housing has really been focusing in on this past year and definitely for this current year that we're in is we are trying to increase leasing utilization um, and thus be able to house more families or help more families more um, to the tune of about 95,000 families we hope to serve. Um, one of the things that you're going to be examining here, um, you'll also be able to 
be not only the, all of this information at the national viewpoint, but you'll also be able to drill down to your state level as you could in your previous voucher dashboard, but now also be able to select a public housing authority and indicate if you'd like to look at MCWs or not MCWs. So for example here, rather than looking at the national viewpoint, I'd like to look at the state of Indiana and I'd also like to be able to examine how about the Fort Wayne Housing Authority. So you can see quickly and easily here that all of the data in the dashboard has adjusted to specifically interact with that um, given housing authority. And you'll be able to see their budget utilization, reserve amount, and a lot of other information around that specific housing authority. But if you want to be able to clear your filters and be able to go back out and look at it at either the state or the national level, you simply click this Clear Your Filters button and everything will default to the national vantage point. So going to the next page, we're going to look at our budget and reserve information. So we have a lot of information around budgets and reserves, both in our total budget authority for the whole HDB program, our total amount of those reconciled reserves as of the end of the calendar year, and what percentage of budget authority is in reserve. We also have how the trend has looked for our housing, housing assistance payments in comparison to budget authority and our budget utilization year over year. So for example, if I wanted to check out how about um, another state network, um, Minnesota, we're going to be able to see quickly and easily which PHAs are holding the largest amount in total reserves as well as what amount of their budget authority is reserved. So one thing you will always want to note is we do have some uh, disclaimer language here. We never want a public housing authority to actually have zero in reserves. We always want there to be a certain minimum reserve balance to ensure that they have the uh, right amount of money to do their operations and meet their monthly obligations. HUD recommends that public housing authorities end the year with no more than the following levels of reserves. So, 4% for PHAs in the large category with over 500 units, 6% for PHAs in the mid-range with 250 to 499 units, and 12% for PHAs under 250 units. So when you examine this information again, you'll notice quickly that while the public housing authority, public housing agency of the city of St. Paul does have quite a bit amount of reserves of 3.6 million, it is holding more than we would normally recommend. So it's over that 4% threshold. So while, but in, um, alternately, you can look at this PHA, the Metropolitan Council, which is holding 1.9 million in reserves. You can see that that's actually under the amount that we would recommend for holding of the reserve balance. So while that number might seem high in total number of reserves, it's actually quite reasonable, if not a little low. And so this information really allows you to see a lot of information around your specific state or your specific public housing authority. So one other thing I want to mention is the fact that when you make a selection in the, as either your state or your public housing authority at the beginning of your interaction with the dashboard, that selection will stay with you throughout your interaction with the dashboard until you clear those filters. So for example, if I go to the next page here, it's all about leasing, my selection of Minnesota is still selected. And so you'll be able to see all sorts of information around your selection as you go through and interact with the dashboard. So for example, here in the state of Minnesota, I can see that on average, the state of Minnesota public housing authority um, in their voucher program have higher than average leasing utilization in compared to the national numbers. Um, and that's something I can see very quickly and easily with this chart. I can also see the overarching trends of vouchers on the street within the state of Minnesota and see that cyclicality here. You can also see what the average 12-month attrition rate is for the state of Minnesota, as well as what the average per unit cost trend that looks like. Um, and so with that, we'll also look into more about leasing changes. So for example, on the next sheet, this is a new page that was not in the previous voucher dashboard. So one of the things you'll notice here is, first off, this is a new page and it has a lot of information on it. These different buttons here will allow you to actually change and look at different charts that are otherwise hidden 
by using these buttons. And so you'll be able to look at new admissions with regard to homeless versus non-homeless admissions, end of participation action, attrition rates, average, and how that's been trending over time, the overarching UMAs or unit months available and unit months leased for the program, as well as that leasing utilization, and our vouchers on the street for the past year. On the right-hand side of your screen, you're going to see information around uh, the PHAs that have had the largest reductions in their units leased in the last year, as well as who's had large increases in their units leased over the last year. Um, so, for example, here, if I wanted to go check out um, Indiana, Indiana, and I wanted to look at PHAs that have had reductions in their units lease, and I want to go look at how about South Bend here. So they've had a reduction in their units lease um, between. Uh, December of 2019 and January of 2021 of about 102 units leased. Um, if I wanted to understand what's going on, by clicking on this chart, all of the information within this page starts to interact with me. So I can look at what has been the trend in that specific PHA for their new admission. And all of, the, all of this information around new admissions and EOP action um, and attrition rate is all coming from the PIC system. Well, vouchers on the street and our units leased are all coming from the voucher management system. So you can see quickly that while they had quite a few new admissions before the pandemic started, once the pandemic started, they definitely had a reduction in their new admissions. And we saw that across a lot of different public housing authorities nationwide. We're starting to see an uptick in those new admissions now for the housing authority of South Bend. Looking at EOP actions, we also saw a decline in EOP actions, which is also similar to nationwide trends. A lot of people did not want to leave their homes during the pandemic, and so we saw a lot of a lot fewer EOP actions, as well as uh, due to that eviction moratorium. So you can see again that's also declined. So while there's less people being admitted to the program, there's also less people leaving. You can look at attrition rates and see that it, the attrition rate was higher in the middle of the beginning of last year before the pandemic really got into, um, gained its strength, and now we've seen that uh, reduction in the attrition rate. And you can see that with vouchers on the street, during those first few months of the pandemic, that specific housing authority actually didn't put any new vouchers on the street for BMS, but they're really starting to do a lot more vouchers on the street recently, and we would expect that those would hopefully parlay themselves into new admissions and hopefully help to increase their leasing and bring those back over to um, something more similar to what they were seeing in previous years rather than having this reduction in leasing. So once we clear those filters, um, the next page focuses all around per unit cost. So per unit cost is focused around, you know, who's had the most increases in per unit cost over the last five years, who's had reductions in per unit cost over the last five years, what is the overarching average per unit cost for that HDB program, uh, and what that trend looks like over time. So for example, if we want to, you know, again, check out Indiana, we'll just stay with that example for right now. And we want to check out um, maybe the City of Warsaw Housing Authority. You can easily see that as you're looking at the City of Warsaw, what their specific per unit cost is right now, as well as what that trend has looked like um, over the past several years, and that they've had a 27% increase in per unit cost um, in the last five years of their program. And so you're able to see a lot of information to identify trends in your per unit cost and see if that's similar to other PHAs um, in your specific state. This next page of the dashboard um, focuses all around housing choice special purpose vouchers. Um, so we have special purpose vouchers focused around the, in the mainstream voucher program, family unification program, Veteran Supportive Housing Program and our Non-Elderly Disabled Program. And what you're going to be able to see here is a quick and easy way to see which PHAs in a given state have these specific programs. 
So um, again, you know, we stick with our example of Indiana. We easily see which PHAs have which of these special purpose voucher programs. So which PHAs have uh, mainstream, BUP, uh, NEDS, and our BASH program. So if we wanted to check out Fort Wayne, you can see easily that Fort Wayne has all three or all four types of these special purpose voucher programs. And you would be able to see the utilization of each of these special purpose voucher programs um, within that specific housing authority. So getting into the next page, um, this is really focused around special purpose doctors and understanding whether like, within your given housing choice voucher program, what is the proportion of special purpose vouchers? So if we're sticking with that Indiana example, and I shouldn't have cleared my filters, um, what you can see here is that Indiana, in comparison to the national average, which is 9%, um, Indiana has about 6.62% of their housing choice voucher program is dedicated to special purpose vouchers. So you can see that that's smaller than the national average, although there are certain PHAs that have a large percentage of their portfolio is made up of special purpose vouchers, such as the Housing Authority of the City of New Albany, which is 47% of their of their HCV program is actually focused around special purpose vouchers and those special populations. So that's really helpful to know, especially as you have new folks coming in um, and understanding exactly what percentage of your program is dedicated to these different special populations. So getting into the new pages of the dashboard, the remaining pages of this dashboard are all going to be focused um, are all brand new to the voucher dashboard 2.0. Um, this very first one is, I know, of a lot of interest to people because it is all around wasting potential. And as we mentioned previously, we do have a wildly important goal in public and immediate housing to increase leasing utilization and thus reduce the leasing potential we're seeing nationwide. What you'll easily be able to see on this report page is a simple definition of what leasing potential is. We also have a more in-depth definition within our data dictionary, and we're in the midst of writing a very fulsome explanation of how leasing potential is calculated, as well as provide examples for how leasing potential is calculated. That document is currently in clearance, and we will be posting it to our web page here. Um, so be on the lookout for that um, in the future. Um, and also, if you have any questions around leasing potential, we encourage you to email us at hcv-dashboard at hud.gov, and we would be happy to answer any questions about how leasing potential for your specific PHA was calculated. Um, so with that, you'll be able to see a lot of information around leasing potential on this page, not only what it is at the national level and the fact that about 3.68% of the total units um, under ACC are leasing units with leasing potential. But you can also see the leasing potential trend over the last several months. And see on the right-hand side of your screen which PHAs actually have the largest amount in pure units of leasing potential, as well as who's holding the largest amount of leasing potential as a percentage of their overall portfolio. So if we wanted to select a given state and be able to check these out, um, we could go check out, let's see somebody different. How about Illinois? And we can quickly and easily see what the leasing potential trend has been for the state of Illinois. You can see that they have 2,453 potential um, families that we could be serving with leasing potential. About 2.19% of their portfolio, so smaller than the national average. And you can see which THAs have the largest amount of leasing potential in pure units as well as who is the largest amount of leasing potential as a percentage of their portfolio. Um, and so that is definitely something we think is helpful in shining a light on so that we can really help to increase our leasing utilization. And when you're looking at leasing potential, um, we're going to be able to talk at the end of this call about a lot of our different um, tools that we have that can help you um, decrease leasing potential within your program and be able to serve more families or help families more. Let's clear the filter, and the, the next two pages of our report really focus all around project-based vouchers. So project-based vouchers are a part of the housing choice voucher portfolio that has been growing um, substantially over the last several years. Back in um, 2015, it was only about 1% of our portfolio. 
Um, it's now 10.6%. So project-based vouchers are growing as a percentage of our portfolio, and so we thought it would be very beneficial for folks to have a better understanding of project-based vouchers in this public-facing dashboard. So this dashboard has a lot of information around not only the amount of the percentage of the portfolio that is project-based vouchers, but showing project-based vouchers leasing over time, um, our project-based vouchers, how many are leased versus unleased over time, as well as what is the percentage or what is the number of uh, types of project-based vouchers. So we have our non-RAD project-based vouchers, RAD 1 and RAD 2, and you can see how those aspects of the program have grown over the last several years. You can also check out if by state or by your public housing authority. So, for example, if I wanted to check out Wisconsin, I could easily see that back in 2015, Wisconsin actually had 0% of their portfolio being project-based vouchers. That's grown in the last year to about 8.9%. That's still lower than the national average, but considering they started from you know, zero, they have grown their portfolio of project-based vouchers over the last um, several years. You can see, too, that a majority of these uh, project-based vouchers in the state of Wisconsin are non-RAD PPP. Although, approximately starting in 2018, they did start using RAD1, and they have had some small RAD2 amounts of units coming online throughout this, um, this time period. Now, when looking at the next page, um, you're going to be able to see what is the percentage of each PHA's portfolio if it is project-based vouchers. So, for example, we can see that there's about uh, within the state of Wisconsin, there's 31 PHAs that have no project-based vouchers at all. There's one PHA that actually has over 50% of their uh, portfolio is project-based vouchers, and other PHAs have a smaller proportion of project-based vouchers as a percent of their portfolio. You can also see here how many PHAs in total have project-based vouchers at these various um, tip points. We will clear these filters so we can talk about it at the national level. So, for example, here you can see quickly and easily that there's 756 PHAs that have project-based vouchers. That's including those that are coming online through an agreement to enter a half contract or a half. We have 744 PHAs that have project-based vouchers under half agreements, and 742 PHAs that have project-based vouchers under half agreements that are actually leased. So, from this, you can infer that there are two PHAs that are have PPVs under half but haven't leased them yet, and 12 that are just starting their PPV program and are entering into a half agreement. You can also see which PHAs have a large percentage of their portfolio being project-based vouchers. Um, so, for example, here, Detroit Housing Authority, you can easily hover over this and see what percentage of their program is project-based vouchers, uh, for project-based vouchers is RAD versus non-RAD PPV. So the final two pages of this report are things that you've seen before. Um, they're information that is on the different other pages of this dashboard, but instead of having to have you drill down and clear filters and do comparisons back and forth, this allows you to do comparative analysis side by side. So this first page is all about budget and reserves, and you'll be able to see the national viewpoint on both sides and then be able to select for your given interest if you want to select a state versus the national number, a public housing versus, versus the national number, or do two PHAs side by side. So, for example, here, um, I'm going to select um, just the state of Ohio, and I want to compare the state of Ohio to the national number. So, here on this budget reserves page, you'd be able to see um, that, in general, the the state of Ohio is holding a smaller percentage of their budget authority and reserves than the national vantage point. Um, a little bit less for budget utilization, but not by much. And obviously, they're going to have a smaller amount in reserves and total budget authority because we're looking at the national picture on this side and the state picture on this side. Now, on the next page of the comparative analysis, you'll be able to compare leasing and per unit cost. So, for example, um, the state of Ohio has a higher than average um, per, uh, leasing utilization in comparison to the national average. It has a slightly higher attrition rate at 9% compared to the national average of 7.34%. And you can see that we have seen 
similar trend around per unit cost, but there has been a higher increase in per unit cost trends in the state of Ohio over this last year in the pandemic than we've seen nationwide. Now, instead of doing a state comparison to the national level, say I want to check out um, PHAs of only one specific size. I just want to look at large PHAs. And I want to check out um, maybe, say, Columbus here in the state of Ohio to another PHA of a similar size in that state. So I want to compare Columbus to Cincinnati. Um, you could easily do this side-by-side -side comparison of like-size PHAs in the same state. Um, or if you feel that there's another peer that's really applicable in another state within your network, you could absolutely do that. Um, so here you can easily see that the Columbus Housing Authority is holding a higher percentage of their money in reserves, 8.89% um, of their budget authority, um, in comparison to Cincinnati, who's actually holding less than our recommended amount of 4% at 3.65%. You also see that in pure numbers of reserves, Columbus is holding a higher amount at over $9 million. Um, and you can see that it does have a higher amount of budget authority as well. They have very similar budget utilization numbers and pretty similar, um, pretty similar uh, unit and budget utilization trend lines. When examining leasing and per unit costs, you can easily see that the Columbus Housing Authority has a lower um, leasing utilization than the Cincinnati Housing Authority, but quite a few percentage points. It also has a lower attrition rate. And so you can see a lot of this information side by side compare per unit cost trends compare attrition rate, leasing utilization, um, and a lot of other information that we think is beneficial. Um, and with that, I'm going to go to the last page of our report and talk about the fact that, you know, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions on the dashboard or if you have any ideas or suggestions for improvement, email us at hcvdashboard at hud.gov. Um, and then I'd also like to reference these projection tools, which I'm going to hand it over to Mike Larisha, who I know you guys are probably very familiar with, who uh, will be able to talk about how you can utilize this dashboard and the, the various tools for projection analysis. Thanks, Marika. Good to be with you uh, in the Region 5. Um, most of you know this stuff pretty well. I'm just going to hit the highlights and remind folks that may not have been familiar with it of the uh, ability to use these tools to plan and look into the future, having had a really good look at the history and the current situation in the dashboard and, compare, and good comparative information, which is always useful. Um, the forecasting tool, of course, is geared towards going deeper uh, in past this leasing potential number, which is sort of a, a good, quick way of trying to, to estimate the amount of resources uh, available to a housing authority uh, to either house more families or to deepen the subsidy, maybe relieve the rent burden, maybe too high, or to them in the market or increase their mobility choices uh, by increasing that uh, buying power, the voucher. Uh, either or both of those can be achieved by the resources that the leasing potential number sort of summarizes. Um, the tool, of course, takes all these factors into consideration that go into trying to project um, leasing and spending, the amount of people leaving the program. We looked at the EOP and the dashboard. Um, you're going to add your own success rate uh, information, which is critical, and then try issuance scenarios uh, and per unit cost uh, trending uh, based on a deeper look at where, where things are going and what's, what's uh, happening in terms of your own uh, actions on, on the payment standard, utility allowances, and the like. And, and as we keep reiterating, the choice uh, between or working together to change the payment standard possibly and increase the leasing, the payment standard tool uh, is another terrific way of uh, modeling what it would look like if you increase the payment standard so that you could see by bedroom size, what the rent burden changes would be if you increase the different bedroom sizes by different amounts, and what the cost per unit change would be. So you can manage this trade-off between how many people get help versus how much help you give people. Um, if you haven't seen the two-year tool recently, 
Um, there's been some nice uh, additions to it, um, particularly on project-based vouchers. If you're one of the PHAs that has a high proportion of your voucher program uh, being project-based vouchers, you not only get a really good portrayal of what's going on with those, but you also get the ability to um, uh, disaggregate the data and see separate data in the tool kind of unfolds to identify project-based vouchers versus tenant-based. And if you have RAD, even RAD and non-RAD from the project-based so that you can manage the leasing of all three uh, at the different per unit costs that they probably have. Um, the other one that's a, a, a really useful addition for Metro PHAs is it identifies zip codes in the per unit cost tab where the uh, small area FMRs are higher than the FMRs. So that if you wanted to use small area FMR exception rents or payment standards, that you could do that. You could see that. You could also see how many vouchers are in each of these zip codes. It's a really handy way to consider maybe targeting your payment standard, uh, exception payment standards, uh, and it's very convenient information, very really good to use. So I just wanted to give you the highlights, and I'll turn it back over to Marika now so that we can get some questions and answers. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, at this point, I think we can open it up for questions. Adam, can you remind folks how they can enter questions in the, in the chat and on the phone? No problem, Marika. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question over the phone, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. And once we get around to it, you, are, you will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. And at that time, please then just state your name and question. So once again, that is pound two. And of course, if you wish to ask a question via the chat, select all panelists from the chat drop-down menu, put your message in the box, and hit enter to send. So one question we did receive um, was why on the new admission tab is there two different bars? And I just wanted to make sure that it's, everybody's aware that we broke out new admissions by non-homeless versus homeless admissions. Um, that's based on what you identify within your 50058 in, in PIC. Um, so it may not be, a, it, it'll be dependent on what you're actually putting on the 50058. It's not necessarily perfect to the McKinney-Vento um, uh, specific identi identification of homeless, but it will be that homeless um, at admission tick, bar, tick mark on the 50058. And so it breaks those down right here. So you can see if you're serving homeless within your specific new admissions or not homeless. Other questions? We don't have any other in chat right now, so. I do not have any on the phone. Um, I do see one in the chat that was sent privately. Would PHAs be able to access this information on the dashboard, or is this only for HUD staff? Oh, ab so absolutely, this is fully public facing. So this dashboard link, this HUD.gov website is fully public. Um, any, dash any PHA would be able to access this dashboard um, via the link and as data is publicly available. We have a HUD internal dashboard as well, which is very similar to this, um, but that does allow folks in the internal dashboard to do exports of the various data. Um, our external public facing does not allow for that um, due to technical capabilities of the Power BI that Microsoft has put out for the public facing version. If Microsoft changes those technical capabilities and does allow for data downloads, we will enable that feature. Are there any other questions that we didn't see in the panel? Uh, I do not have any. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question over the phone, it is pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the queue. All right, and I do not have any questions in the queue at this time. Okay. Well, thank you. We will give everybody back about 15 minutes of their Friday afternoon. 
Um, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I know, um, you know, coming in on a Friday afternoon for something so data intensive is not necessarily the way you want to enter into your weekend, but we really hope that this tool is very helpful for everyone and um, is, is uh, enjoyable in your use. If you have any questions at all, we really do encourage you to email us at hcv-board at hud.gov. Um, and we will be very excited to answer those questions. Um, one final question just did come in on the chat um, saying, is this current and how soon will the new information be updated? Um, this information is current as of January 2021. Um, we do expect to do an update to February numbers within the next week. Um, anytime we update the data, you will always see that in the um, different, uh, in the, um, summary pages, identifying the vintage of the data here, as well as on every page will always give you the vintage of that data. And this data is always going to be updated monthly. So this is not something that you'll only see on a quarterly basis. We will keep this up updated on a monthly basis. Um, and we just really want to, uh, I'll close this out unless there's any other final questions in the chat, but uh, we're happy to stay on the line if you have more questions. Um, we really do appreciate everybody spending this time with us on this Friday afternoon. Uh, we hope this tool is helpful, and please feel free to reach out to us at that hcv dashboard at hud.gov. We really do take um, questions seriously. We respond back to those um, with our different colleagues from our program support division, and we do take any suggestions um, to heart. A lot of these additions to this dashboard are a direct result of user feedback. So thank you, everybody, for joining. We really do appreciate it, and we hope that this is a useful tool. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our call today. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced, and you may now disconnect.